have been introduced in very extravagant terms, you know. I welcome a man who's going to bring us straight into the presence of God. Uh, and I think, okay, no pressure then. The Profile with Premier Christianity magazine. You're listening to The Profile here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Sam Hales. I'm the editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the magazine that sponsors this show. And you can read this interview in the latest print edition as well. I'm delighted to say that my guest today right here on The Profile is Graham Kendrick. Graham has been described as a father of modern worship music whose songs are crammed full of poetic, divine, biblical truth that have sculpted a view of God that has impacted generations. For more than 30 years, Graham's been at the forefront of Christian music, both here in the UK, having written and recorded hundreds of songs. But he's also well known around the world for his tracks, including Shine Jesus Shine, Knowing You, The Servant King and Amazing Love. This month, Graham is marking 50 years since his first album, Footsteps on the Sea. And in order to mark the occasion, Graham has collaborated with Jake Isaac to produce a new EP of story songs. And it includes a new version of the song that started it all, Simon's song, Footsteps on the Sea. That EP has just been released. It's called Where It All Began and is available on all the usual streaming platforms. We're going to talk a little bit about that EP as well as Graham's wider life and career in music. Delighted to say that he joins us right here on The Profile to discuss all that and more. Graham, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. We always like to go back to the beginning on The Profile and hear actually about a person's early life growing up. Can you tell us something of your story? What was your experience of God like as a child? Well, my uh, my father was a pastor, um, a Baptist pastor, uh, and I was a third third child, and uh, so I was born in Northamptonshire, a little village called Blisworth, and he was the pastor of uh, the Baptist chapel there. So that was my home for the first uh, few years. It was actually there that I made my first kind of personal step towards Christ. You know, when you're a child, you grow up in a Christian home and it's it's just part of your life. You imagine that everybody goes to church and sings hymns or choruses or, you know, hears Bible stories or, or, or something. Um, and uh, so I remember one night my um, mother, it must have been a Sunday night, I think my dad was probably preaching in the evening service and myself and my older sister and brother were at home and she would typically read us a story. Um, and there was a story which was um, uh, in which the main character um, came to faith and learned about the Christian faith. So it was a great children's um, children's story storybook. And I remember she came to the end of the chapter where the, the, the main character had made a step of faith. And uh, she closed the book and she said, well, children, do any of you want to do what, um, you know, the character in the book in the book did? And I uh, sound like a good idea. It's my mother, after all, you know. <laughs> um, but she was uh, wise enough to say, "Well, you better just uh, pray by yourself. You know, I'm not going to do it for you." Um, and uh, I think I remember going off to just a corner of the room and and leaning down and praying. Um, and I can't remember the words I prayed, but I was saying, "Yes, you know what I just heard about in the story." I. I want that, you know, um, and I can remember um, something it was like something exploded in my chest, you know, I thought oh, some, something happened, you know, and when you're a child, when you're sort of five years old or so, you know, you, you don't have the words, you just remember it. And that is imprinted on my memory to this to this day. Something happened when I prayed as a child and it was a beginning. Um, so obviously, you know, growing up through, uh, we, we went on to another church and another church. Um, and as you grow up, you discover that uh, not everybody believes the same thing. So your faith gets tested. Um, but I've been, you know, I, I understood that uh, you had to be willing to stand up for what you believed. And, and, and there were occasions. Uh, I was a very shy little boy. But um, I remember in one class, I think it must have been in primary school. Uh, or maybe early in the secondary, but a teacher sort of said, any of you here Christians, you know? 
Um, and I stood up and said, I am, you know, everyone looks at you and thinks, you know, well, we're not, I mean, this was the sixties by then probably, or, you know, it was, it was the beginning of the kind of, um, casting off anything, which was from the past and, and the church and Christianity was like, oh, we've, we've had it with that stuff, you know, but so it was important for me to stand up for my faith. Um, yeah. And do you remember at what time you had an interest in music? So obviously your, your faith was a very early age, five, six years old. Did you have an interest in music from, from that young as well? It was there. Uh, my father is a very good um, self, self-taught um, pianist and um, uh, he used to play the piano accordion as well. Uh, so he was kind of one of those all-in-one pastors, you know, the pastor who preaches yes. <laughs> and pastors and... Um, and there's a lot of there's they, a lot of great pastors like that out there probably <laughs> listening right now and we salute you, the pastors we, who <laughs> lead the worship and do the preaching and everything in between. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I can remember, because so it was there, the hymns, hymns were there, the children's choruses with, he called Sally the squeeze box. That was, that was the name as far as the kids were concerned for the piano accordion. Um, but I can remember, you know, I remember it sticks in my head was um, uh, on a Sunday evening, I guess, um, there was sometimes an after church um, gathering at, at the pastor's house. Um, and before we went to bed, we, we were able to be there for a little while. I remember he, on one occasion, certainly he probably usually did it. He pulled the piano out into the middle of the room, took the panels off to get more volume. <laughs> and uh, it's equivalent to turning up to number 11, you know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, and then people gather around the piano um, and I'd be sitting on the floor with my brother and sister, you know, in the corner um, with this booming piano and all these voices and people shouting out their favorites uh, and, and singing in harmonies and so on. Uh, just a very ordinary local Baptist chapel in the village, but people just love singing. And they knew all the songs, so they didn't actually give the tithe, they shout out the number because everyone knew what what their fav the number of their favorite song was so yes i, I soaked it up um i had n uh, not a, such a great experience with piano lessons and the teacher kind of gave me up really <laughs> and uh simply because i wasn't making the connection between the the lines and the dots and the sounds but i had a really good ear um so little somewhat later i um picked up the guitar um, and I think it was one that was stuck in, in, a, in a wardrobe somewhere and was, had, was needed gluing together, but my dad did that for me. And so I started to make my own way. I thought, right, I'm going to get some sounds out of this thing. I don't want lessons, you know, <laughs> I don't want that pain anymore. <laughs> uh, and that's probably the best thing for me because just starting with six strings and um, a general idea that the, the, there are chords, I started just responding to the sounds um yeah well i'm i'm very jealous of that graham because my own music background is is i can just about read music but i'm terrible at playing by ear so the fact that you have uh, that ear for music which i know a lot of musicians do is incredible and i've i've seen it done where musicians will just be listening to a song pick up their instrument and just start playing along with no music it's a real it's a real gift do you remember writing your first song um no i don't um the when I started writing, uh, I was probably about 15, 15 years old or something, and in the Baptist church in southwest London at that time. And what was happening in the sort of Baptist network um, of churches, and that was kind of our world, you know. Uh, remember, there's no social media, you know, you've got two channels on the television, um, and on your black and white television or something, <laughs> and uh, um, so your world becomes, you know, the other. Baptist churches you connect with and the events that draw you, you know, to, together. And um, this was the 60s and, um, you know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones were bursting on the scene, youth culture, everything was changing culturally in a big, in a big way. Um, and the, in that network, there were people just a few years older than me who were starting to use music um, to 
connect with young people who were no longer coming to church, you know. Um, and coffee bars sprang up, Christian coffee bars. You convert the church hall, you know, you'd unscrew the bulbs and put coloured ones in and hang up fishing nets or something like that. And you create a sort of a vibey atmosphere. And then you'd print flyers and go out on the streets because, you know, nothing much to do out there. Uh, so kids were willing to come in, um, uh, free coffee, hear a band. And I was one of those bands. So we, you know, we copied that trend formed our own little band with my sister Julia, my brother Peter and uh, Richard, a, a friend and one to a Margaret, one a few folks, you know, youth, the youth group, a few people in the youth group, that's what you do. Um, and then you need songs because all these bands have got their own style. Some are folk bands, some are sort of progressive, heavy, you know, uh, all, just anything you can imagine. Um, so I guess out of necessity, I started to, you know, to write some songs so we didn't have to just copy other people's that weren't particularly our style. Um, and so just by trial and error, really. Um, mm. And of course, when, when, you, when you play a song to a few of your mates and, and they say, oh, that's, that's quite good. You, uh, you know, you suddenly swell with confidence um and uh, i think i told my mother when i was about 15 that i wanted to be a songwriter and uh, you know she was very you know she's very positive that i had a, an ambition but it wasn't i don't think the one that she had in <laughs> my i must say my parents were very very um generous hearted in that they wanted us to thrive in what we really want to do. So there's no pressure to be this or that, you know? Yeah. Um, but um, the idea of being a songwriter, I don't think you'd ever heard that you could do that, you know, no. um, as a, as a career or something. Yeah. And these, these songs early on, because I think some people might be surprised, surprised. No, you haven't only ever just written worship songs, these, these songs early mm. on. And, and certainly the, the first album that you released, it wasn't really worship music in the way that we might understand it today, was it? It was more story based. Do you want to explain a bit of that? Yes, um, it was an era um, of the singer songwriter, you know, it, it, the music we were listening to on our um, transistor radios um, on uh, pirate stations, you know, because uh, the BBC wouldn't play it. Um, you know, you, you were hearing things, obviously the Beatles were there and then they began to go into that sort of whole storytelling era Eleanor Rigby and, and 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 so on but there was also Simon and Garfunkel you know Paul Simon is a great storyteller in songs Joni Mitchell I I gravitated towards that um uh you know that that narrative storytelling sort of vibe and I think it appealed to me because I've been brought up on the bible stories I I loved creative writing it's probably my favorite thing at, at, at school you know um so uh, that I gravitated to, <clears throat> towards that. And when the little band that we had broke up because everyone went their separate ways to college and, and, and so on, uh, I had no context to, you know, to sing my song because I didn't used to sing, actually. My, my, my brother and sister used to sing and one or two others in the band. <clears throat> um, so I traded in my electric guitar for an acoustic guitar and um, started to write songs just just write songs and i i i was very very nervous about singing um i had took me years to find my voice you know just through sheer um terror i think of singing. <laughs> um but because no one else was going to sing them and they were a bit quirky and individualistic anyways you know they were you know so they were my kind of song and no one else was quite singing that uh, that i knew um so I had to sing them myself. Um, I can remember singing, uh, I think I did one of those songs in the latter days of the band that we had, which, by the way, we had a wonderful name called The Whispers of Truth, um, which is kind of, in a sort of, we had that in a kind of psychedelic, psychedelic lettering on the drum, on the bass drum and stuff like that. But I remember, you know, I'd do a, 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 a one song solo spot, borrow my sister's guitar and uh, just sing this story about somebody who, you know, was off to find the meaning of life kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, I love talking uh, about this, this kind of era, 
1960s, 1970s. Yeah. Like you said Christians opening up coffee shops because that was the that was the cool thing to do and this kind of yeah. underground music scene. I love all that because that's part of our history actually at Premier Christianity magazine. We started life as Buzz magazine way back in 1965. Okay. Yes. I don't know if yeah. you remember Buzz. Oh well, absolutely. I mean that that was it started as a as just sort of broadsheet to connect the bands around London and around the country. Uh, and, and um, you know, so there'd be an ad in there, you know, Vox AC30 amp for sale or, you know, Gibson guitar or something like that. And uh, we all started connect and, and guys um, uh, like was it, it was Pete Meadows and Jeff Shearn and Dave Payne, and John Webb, they were very entrepreneurial and they formed something called MGO, Musical Gospel Outreach, very much a, a evangelistic heart. Um, to, to because that's what the bands were doing. That was the motivation. Uh, and they started running workshops um, and um, uh, and running tours and they formed a record company. Um, so my very first album, I mean, I got asked to go on one of their tours. Um, I think it was with Nigel Goodwin, who's a poet and sort of uh, as a performance poet and Judah McKenzie, who was a uh, really great singer songwriter of, of the day and they wanted a guitarist uh, and they recruited me which wasn't perhaps the greatest idea but he put me on the tour <laughs> <laughs> and on the tour um bus um uh, as you're traveling long distances you know people start strumming songs and and so i got to play a few of my singer songwriter songs which they didn't really know about um and this is the nearest I can get to the big break story. Okay, was this <laughs> on one of these tours? We were due to um, uh, scheduled in, in a few days' time to be at Westminster Central Hall, kind of make kind of major venue. Um, certainly in the context of of those those days, and there was an American band who stole our name actually because uh, we previously the Whispers of Truth were called the Forerunners, and then they came along and. Um, Anyway, we, 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 we were happy to let them, we changed our name. Um, anyway, they couldn't make it. I don't know why it was, um, but for some reason uh, they couldn't come. So there was a gap in the program and um, the guys who, who were running it um, approached me and said, how about, you know, would you be willing to do, it's like 15, 20 minutes, you know, um, and that's about all, all I could fill actually at that time with songs. Um, and um, uh, and I did, uh, um, and it went down well enough for them to say, let's make an album, you know? Um, so that was the Footsteps on the Sea album. And that was your first album, yeah. 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 Um, just going back to something you said about the, the song, the storytelling songwriters, and you mentioned Simon Garfunkel and, and others in the mainstream who were doing that. If we look at the music scene today, both in the mainstream and in, certainly in the Christian world, you could argue that kind of storytelling just isn't around as much. I mean, just just before coming on air, I was uh, listening to one of your songs on YouTube and there was a comment from someone who said, wow, Graham, this this song of yours, you know, that told, I think it was one of Jesus parables, that I never really understood that parable until I heard your song and your song explained it. And I think the commenter said, you know, can you go back to writing those kinds of songs rather than the worship oh, really? stuff? And it's it's interesting because certainly when you look at the Christian music scene now, you could argue a lot of it is this kind of God focused worship, which we'll come on and talk about in a moment. Mm. But both in the Christian and arguably in the mainstream, there isn't that same kind of you tell a story through song, is there? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. It is true. Um, I mean, obviously, you've got two genres. You've got the kind of. Um, congregational worship genre which is one thing and then you've got the more performance concert type thing and certainly in those early days it was the concert thing that was was happening you, you know this was pre the praise and worship explosion which really happened sort of from the late 70s into the into the early um 80s um and it was all about that was all message music really um uh, so, uh, f for me, it was um, it was a means to communicate with um, the folks around me. For I, I, I started writing those songs at college, right? So I'm a student, I'm a teacher trained in college, 
we have a very active Christian union. Uh, we're really trying to reach out um, and share our faith. Um, and actually, we think we were the biggest organization on campus, actually. Um, uh, and uh, we did all sorts of, of stuff. But um, there was an opportunity there to, that if, you, if you wanted a conversation, it was no good just stating your beliefs. You had to draw people in. I think it's still true, really. And, a, and telling a story in a song is a great way to start a conversation, you know. Um, so I would write, a, you know, I would write a song like Simon's song you mentioned earlier, um, describing when um, Simon Peter encountered Jesus by the shores of Galilee and his life completely changed, you know. Um, and it worked as a as a kind of folk club story song but everyone why well, by the time you finished it people are sort of thinking yeah i think there's more to this song than just this simon guy i think i've heard oh yes i think this is this is about jesus <laughs> but if you if you could win people with the song they'd they'd give you a hearing if the song yeah. was rubbish i think they 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 wouldn't be interested you know yeah um and, and do you remember it may not have been as stark or as obvious as this, but do you remember there being a point in your life where you you went from doing those story songs to you sort of looked around and think, oh wow, I am now I am now writing worship songs, and actually there's this thing called being a worship leader, which may not yes. have even really existed when you started out. Do you remember that kind of transition? It was a very gradual thing because um, during the so I, I went full time with my singer songwriter thing in 1972. Um, and already there was uh, a new a renewal movement brewing in the churches. People started talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, and and you know that in, in my background with all the great Bible teaching and all that we did have, there wasn't a great deal of experience of the Holy Spirit. Um, and I I was really hungry for for that. I was fed up with reading about it in books that so other people experienced this and that. You know, I wanted to taste it myself. You know. Um, and that set me on a journey, um, which ended up with with me being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and that was a release moment. OK, uh, definitely. But and I suppose what happened there is that I began to uh, engage in I'd, I'd be whether it was a house group or a meeting or something, we would worship in a different way than I was used to. You know, this was much more. Um, it was like waiting on God. It was like worshiping God in with simple songs while you waited for the Spirit to to do something, you know. Um, and a lot of people who wanted to be filled with the Spirit would come to meetings like that, and often the Spirit of God would touch them just in in the worship. It was a way of receiving, and it didn't matter how long you went on or how often you repeated the song, because it was all about encountering encountering God. So this was happening. Uh, meanwhile, I was doing my singer-songwriter thing. Um, late, uh, a, a little later on, um, in the 70s, I, I was in a team, a uh, travelling mission team. Um, and we, we were like a little, uh, a, a little travelling church, in a sense, only about 10 or a dozen of us. Um, but, you know, we worshipped together. We were very close because we were so busy you know you had to do a two-week mission have a couple of days and go off to the next one you know um but we were working with local churches so i got the job um of leading uh, the sing the communal singing you know and using some of these songs that i'd heard and picked up from the little home groups and and so on so i was cutting my teeth as a, a worship leader because I already had skills as a performer, so it was a matter of expand, ex, extending those into this thing of now I need to get the people singing. But in that little team, there were moments when um, maybe it was something someone was going through. Uh, I would a song. I would write a song for them, um, or something we were struggling with. And I remember, uh, as a, as every team does, you know, you you have relational, as uh, you know struggles sometimes and you have tensions in the room when you're supposed to be praying you know the meetings starting in 20 minutes and you know not everybody's happy with everybody else you know and I remember in the middle of that 
a, a song came to mind um, and the, the, it was a prayer. Jesus stand among us at the meeting of our lives. Be our sweet agreement at the meeting of our eyes. You know, Jesus, we love you. So we gather here and so on. And I, I, I sang it and it helped us. It helped us to get Jesus in, in the center, you know. And there were a few songs like that that would kind of naturally arise. Uh, and then they would get on the grapevine. Uh, and the way the grapevine worked with the with the latest technology of the day, which was the overhead projector. Ah, the, the OHP. The how OHP. We, how we have fond memories of it and the acetates being backwards and the wrong way around. Absolutely. Uh, what it did, because, you know, previously it was the era of hymn books and you get a new edition maybe once a generation, you know, 25 years or something, you get the new edition with some new songs in, some old ones bumped off. Um, but suddenly just in the time it would take to scrawl the words of a song you could flash it up and you could just there it is you've got your words uh, and you know that's how songs spread so a few of mine among many others like dave dave bilber and chris bowater and um and and so many others um were doing the same thing in their little context um so songs started to just get out on, on the grapevine and that's how mine began um but there was there was a moment um you know if as i say this is a long journey but i remember um i actually in 1978 the folks who were um doing the i, I was doing an album maybe once a year or something like that and um one of the guys i was working closely with was jeff shern and uh i happened to mention that i've been writing these songs and he said oh, okay that's interesting um uh, and as a result, we actually did a worship album. This was 1978. So that was my very first worship album, Jesus Stand Among Us. That song I just described um, was, the, was the title track. And I just about had enough songs to fill that album. So that was 1978. But 1979, um, the first spring harvest happened. Um, and uh, I've been working with Clive Calver in this uh, team, and he'd become the uh, national director of, of British Youth for Christ. Um, and, um, and Pete Meadows, who founded Buzz magazine uh, and done all these other things um, entrepreneurially, um, the two of them got together and conceived this idea of a, of a kind of a youth festival with seminars, you know, something like that. And they called it Spring Harvest. Um, so in 1978, Clive and I went on some epic tour of 55 dates or something um, with boxes of flyers to, for this new event. And I'd written uh, a song called God Put a Fighter in Me. And it was all about, come on, folks, we've got a, there's a battle to fight. You know, there's a, there's a mission we've got to engage with. And it was a call, a call to discipleship and to action and to pour, giving your life to, you know, spreading the word of Christ and 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 so on. Um, so spring harvest happened, but it was more like a kind of a Christian Woodstock. You know, it was a, a it's about three thousand people. Um, you know, a tent and some seminars at the Butlins um, Holiday Centre. Um, but most of the pro, lot of the program was bands one after the other, which was great because that was what was happening in the day. But I remember Clive coming up to me one evening when I was due to do um, a 40 minute set of my singer songwriter songs. He said, Graham, we have a we have a problem. Um, we've got all these great bands um, and we love them. But the people want to worship. You know, there's just a hunger rising. People just want to worship. They they love the music, but they actually want to participate in something would you mind giving up your set and um your performance set and just going out and leading some worship and you know i i i did have to sort of take a bit of a deep breath and think okay because my my image of myself as much as the artist i am the singer songwriter i also lead a bit of worship on the side you know when necessary happy to do that love it love it but yeah, that was my, so, but I knew it was what I had to do. And moments like that, I think, 
set a, yeah. another ball rolling because the response back and particularly to the songs I've written, it was like a new generation wanted to give voice to worship in, in terms of their own mm. culture. Yeah. And I was just there. Yeah. And it's, it's remarkable to reflect back on that moment, I think because of what's happened since, because since that moment, that kind of hunger for worship, it, it has to use the modern terminology, it has kind of gone viral, not just in the oh, UK, yeah. but internationally. Yeah. You think, well, mm. now when Christians gather, it is, it is to worship. You look at the biggest mm. Christian events and conferences and churches and a huge amount of time and money investment now goes into, we want to sing together. We want to corporately mm. sing mm. worship to God. Mm. And, and you, as you so well described there, that wasn't the norm, even mm. at that first yeah. spring harvest. It was, no, you'd go along and you'd watch some Christian singer-songwriters. So you think the, the change there has been dramatic. Mm. And um, I suppose this is why, as I said at the beginning, you have been described as a father of modern worship music because of that experience mm. that you describe at somewhere like Spring Harvest. Um, how do you feel when you hear that term, a father of modern worship music? <laughs> Oh, I wonder what I might get blamed for, I suppose. <laughs> we'll come on to that in a moment, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, and there were many fathers, you know, around the world. Um, you know, the folks that, that, um, that started Scripture in Song off in, in New Zealand. Um, uh, and um, the Jesus movement, the West Coast of America. There was so many that came out of that, you know, um, that, that started to write worship songs, Maranatha music, and um, Jim and Carol Owens, uh, <clears throat> and their their musicals that kind of took a different kind of worship out to the churches, a different, you know. So there, there were there were many fathers and mothers um, out there. Uh, I guess it's just it's, I mean, it's, you can't just say it's an accident of history, but it, you know you you, you don't say you, you don't set out to be this or that. You just take the next step, <clears throat> and um, uh, and and look back and and see. Well, I suppose you could describe it like that. But at the time, we were just doing the next thing yeah. that we felt we you know we 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 should we should do. Yeah, it's funny you said a moment ago. You wonder what you might be blamed for. And um, <laughs> yeah, I did want to ask you both both the positive and the negative. I suppose of yeah. of the last fifty years of what we now understand as this this modern mm. worship movement. By which I mean modern songs again things that people of my generation might take for granted that they could go to a charismatic evangelical church there'd be a, a kind of style of music but also what you described as this this renewal that happened in the 1970s mm -hmm. and 80s that again people of my generation would take for granted because this is just normal church and actually you describe really well there how you no know, there was this moment in kind of recent church history where there was this move of the spirit and everything became quite mm -hmm. different <clears throat> But nevertheless, re reflecting on that, on this, on this modern worship movement and all that came with it over the past decades, what are your reflections, both positive and perhaps more critical mm. or negative, of of how things have changed in the church world that you are pleased about and and proud to have been a part of, and other elements that you mm. think actually we we might need to rethink that, or I'm you know mm. perhaps concerned about the direction we've gone in in certain ways. Mm. Yes, yes. Um... I think one of the interesting <clears throat> things about the, the context it started in is that the big emphasis um, in, in my up, in my teens and whatever, it was, it was very much Bible teaching, right? Um, <clears throat> and there was still a lot of sort of preaching centers where people would travel to hear great preachers. And I used to go down to hear David Pawson at Millwind Center when I was, a, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was a student, I just loved um, hearing good Bible teaching. Um, and I remember um, uh, in the more evangelistic outreach way, you know, Gordon Bailey, who passed away last year, I believe, was an outstanding communicator um, and did masses in, in schools. Um, uh, but he, he was an amazing storyteller, so he could take a Bible story um, and have you rolling in the aisles and then make his, make his point, you know. Um, so, but I think the, the point is that this renewal movement happened in, in groups of people who are very much Bible people. So you got, you were soaked in the word and then you got the spirit. You put the word and the spirit together, it's absolute dynamite, you know? And I think what has happened because the experiential then began to become much more prominent, 
that um, the teaching teaching of the Bible started to get sidelined, you know, um, and it seemed it seemed to be, or it felt like. I'm not saying this how it really was, but it felt like where it was really happening was when you worshipped, the spirit came, stuff happened, and that was absolutely true. But um, I was fortunate enough. Um, to be 20 years in a church in London from the mid 80s called the Exodus Christian Fellowship uh, founded by Roger and Faith Forster. And I think they had a great balance with the Bible teaching and the worship and the intercession and the outreach and the, and, and the mission and so on. But I think where um, the experiential takes over, if you like the spirit takes over, uh, the, the emphasis on the spirit takes over from the emphasis on the, on the word, it's easy to lose the plot. I mean, and I say lose the plot, I mean, literally, because the, 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 the Bible is, is a story, we have a story to tell. You know, when, when, um, when Paul talks about the gospel he preaches, he goes straight back to, you know, uh, to, to Christ, God incarnate, in, died on a cross, buried in a tomb. It is the story, that is the unique thing about the gospel it is a, a story based in history in time and space you can there are endless experiences to be had out there in the world but there is only one story that says god was made flesh and it is the telling of that story and the stories around it and the bible is a book of stories that actually becomes the framework for how we should live our lives not just the subjective experiences um so I've always um, tried to put a big emphasis on telling the story. And if I can write a worship song that um, puts the personal experience and response within a Bible story, it might just be a reference to a Bible story, but it's there. You, you know, you could trace back to the Bible passage if you wanted to in the song. I think that's a really important thing. Um, um, and I, and I think actually some of the best, um, it's not that it's not happening. I think maybe it's my perspective, all the songs I like, but I'm, there have been a lot of good songs um, by some of the really famous song producing churches and movements that tell the story brilliantly. And those seem to be, to, in my mind, those seem to be the ones that we sing a lot and we really need them. But there's, there are more stories to tell that you know the core one obviously the incarnation and, and and the crucifixion and the resurrection and and the return but around that there are masses of untold uh, what's that a phrase i i i wrote down a while ago um the unsung jesus what about the jesus we don't sing about or the stories we don't sing about and because we're not a bible literate church now in the way that we used to be if we don't sing it do we even know that those stories exist, you know? Um, so we have to restore the balance, I think. Yeah. Um, and you can't do it all in songs. Uh, one, of, one of the guys who was a sort of uh, one of the uh, many mentors um, in my earlier days um, feels quite strongly that um, there there used to be a worship leading a lot of these Bible weeks where you had the worship leader and then you had um, other leaders with other giftings who uh, would be expected if they felt this has something from God to interrupt the worship leader and bring a, bring a word and then hand back again or maybe the meeting might go off in a completely different direction. I think it's got a good good point. And I think this probably happens in many good local churches, but it's very you get the impression that you hand over to the worship leader and the band, yeah. and that's it. That's everything. <laughs> and they do what they like. And they do what they like. Um, but, you know, I grew up with team ministry, and I, you know, I believe apostle, prophet, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist, we have to have these gifts. They're not all platform gifts, but we need those different gifts to bring, to bring the balance. I think the other thing that has happened is that... <laughs> um, I think we've now come to an expectation that encounter with God, um, that you have to be worshipping to have an encounter with God, right? 
worshipping sung worship. Let's, let's say sung worship, you know. Um, and so rather than thinking, yes, we could encounter God just as much in the preaching or just as much in the liturgy um, or, you know, in the personal fellowship or um, in the reading of the word, you know, the load. And I felt that pressure as a worship leader, you know, that I've been introduced in, 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 in uh, very extravagant terms, you know. I'm going to welcome a man who's going to bring us straight into the presence of God. Uh, and I think, okay, no pressure then. <laughs> um, you know, but, and I've watched other worship leaders have done it myself. You get to a certain point and you've done what you, you've, you've given it. You know, you felt you've, you've, you've had an anointing and, and you've, you know, you've, you've done, you've given it, right? But there's still half an hour to go. You know, and you're obliged to carry on when perhaps we should be moving into yes. uh, intercession or we should be moving into some teaching of the word or some exhortation or yeah. or just some and say, okay, that's enough. Now go and do it. Yeah. You know, um, so we have, I think, got stuck into a, a box, a, you know, mm. a kind of concert, arena concert box. Yes. Which... It can be great in the right context, but it's it's not the whole it's not the whole story. It's it's funny you mentioned that about timing because it, it reminds me of something that that Tim Hughes said when I interviewed him. He said we got to this point where you, you go somewhere as a worship leader and you have twelve minutes and thirty seconds to do your thing, and then you know when the clock runs out, that's it. And and again, it's it's same point you're making. Whether it's actually we can finish a bit early or we can overrun, it's it's the same point, isn't it? Of if we're going to be spirit led, then perhaps we shouldn't put too many parameters around these things. Yes, I, I mean, I, I live in that kind of world of tensions, you know, because, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I can be, I might be at a festival, I might be given a, I might have a whole evening to do what I like with, or I might be leading in my local church on a Sunday morning, two services where you've got to finish the first one. So there's enough time. Yeah. And there's practical considerations, which is understandable. Absolutely. Yeah. And you've got the kids and the kids workers and, you know, you, you, you've you've got a timing so you have to do that so what do you do what well, do you find another space where you can be more free-flowing you know uh, you can an evening where the kids aren't there and and those who have uh, able come and you can just worship or you can have a prayer evening or healing evening or something and without those kind of parameters so we have to find other ways of of doing it because all these things are valid are valid and Im important so we live in that kind of tension um, but it's hopefully a, cr a creative um, tension um, but i think one other thing i would say is that in every generation we have to be aware of what the dominant culture which is obviously a you know a secularized culture in the in the west where that pushes us and culture is something that becomes invisible. You don't realize how much you're being influenced by the way things are, you know? It's only when you maybe read a bit of history or uh, look at something uh, or visit another country where the culture is different, um, uh, you suddenly realize, you know, I've been in countries in Asia particularly, which are very communal. Um, and, you know, you suddenly realize, Boy, we are so individualistic in the West, you know. Um, uh, and are we right and are they wrong? You know, but we have to be willing to step back or we have to step back and evaluate our culture. And one of the elements of our culture is it has become very experiential. Experience is put above truth, you know. Um, I grew up where truth was above everything else, you know, and there was a, a moral, a higher moral law that people assume, but now it's all down to the individual, you know. Um, and I think we have to be careful that songs don't all become about about us, you know, that yeah. we're in the center of the universe. It's like Copernicus, you know, and he's, he got into a lot of trouble. And he said, actually, you know, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun, you know. And I think in our culture, we think everything revolves around us. And we think God 
revolves around us mm. and runs after us just to give us all that we need because we're so important. But actually, like the earth runs around us, we, God is the centre of it all. And we need to keep remembering, remembering that. More. 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 We often want more, but is it always a bad thing? Isn't wanting more knowledge a good thing? What about more understanding? More perspective. More wisdom. More action. More inclusion. Discover more of the good things at the brand new Premier Christianity magazine website. So much more than a monthly magazine, Premier Christianity website helps you go deeper in your faith and is full of inspiration of what God is doing in the world today. It's Premier Christianity, but so much more. Register today at premierchristianity.com. premierchristianity.com I'm sure you've probably never done an interview, Graham, where the words shine, Jesus, shine haven't featured. Um, <laughs> it is, of course, your most popular, most well-known song. I, and I'm sure you'll know this already, but um, it, probably, it probably happens regularly. But I certainly remember a few years ago listening to a mainstream radio station and they're asking people for their primary school assembly bangers. And it was wonderful to hear people would ring into the radio show and say, oh, shine, Jesus, shine. And, and then the DJ would play a bit of, of shine, Jesus, shine. And people have these amazing memories, actually, of, of very, very young children. They can still, you know, years yeah. on, remember yeah. that song. Um, do you remember? Did you hear that when that happened on the radio? What's what's your what's your thoughts on this on this song that so many people, not just Christians, actually have very fond memories of? Yes, I, I um, someone referred to it, me to it, and I think I heard a few snippets of it after, after the uh, event, and 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 it was it was great fun to he hear about it. I mean, it's always a great surprise um, that that has happened in the sense that it's it's a very Jesus song. You know, it's all about Jesus, you know. Yes. But somehow um, it, it, the kids just love it and um, who don't, don't, don't know about Jesus. I'm just so grateful that uh, it's put the name of Jesus on so many kids' lips uh, and that they have a connection uh, with it, even though they might just think, oh, it's a song, you know, it's a song like lots of other, uh, other songs. Um, so I think it's an amazing thing, and I'm, uh, it's one of the things which gives me the, the most satisfaction to know that children, yeah. if, you know, several ge generations, you know, um, have got that song into them, uh, yeah. inside them. And I have met people and heard people who that was their only connection, and, and, and in a moment of um, desperation, wanting to pray, but never having had any vocabulary of prayer would pray with those words and god met them you know wow. um and if i've heard a handful of those stories there's probably a lot more than, i hope so yeah there's, a, there's there's a lot there's a lot more out there yeah and, and do you have any kind of inkling you know when you were writing a song like that do, you know do you have a sense of oh i, I think this one might kind of go a bit further than somewhere other song you know i think i think i'm onto something here uh i was a bit slow on the uptake on on that because and i think because um a lot of musicians we, we we're into stuff that's kind of a bit clever and or has got a really great tune or in and at the time i was you know putting together a, a, an album and i had other songs I was more excited about. You hear this sometimes, don't you, of bands yeah. who, who have to play a particular popular song at every show and hate doing it because they don't actually like it, but it's their <laughs> most popular song. I hope that's not the case for you. No, no. I, th I think what I had learned by, by that time um, was about road testing songs and, and uh, the, in the church I was in in London. Um, I was very privileged to be able to try out songs um we did have very long meetings so it didn't matter too much if you spent 10 minutes in teaching a song at the be at the beginning and i would always listen for that sound you know if, if people you know are they really getting this are they starting to worship and that's that's always what told me the story and there was even you know, i remember a couple of times when you'd you'd lead a song once maybe you would lead a song another time maybe and then it was like wow something Something came on that song, you know, um, and I think probably it was it was at Spring Harvest when 
I taught it and it just went boom, you know, and people were just singing and then it, you know, obviously had legs and started to run all over, all over the place. But um, no, I, I was, I wasn't really expecting, I wasn't expecting that. Mm. I mean, when I actually wrote that chorus, because I wrote it in two parts, I wrote the three verses, uh, like a hymn. Right. And I tried that out. And, um, uh, and I could tell that people thought, yeah, yeah, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's okay, you know. Um, but I knew it wasn't very special. And, and um, several people had said to me, and I thought I agreed with them that this, this needs us, this is verses needing a chorus, you know. And when the moment came, um, when I was, you know, when the chorus unfolded, it did come unusually, just the chorus part. Uh, I'd already really written the verses, as I say, but the chorus came uh, quite quickly and with a sense of, ooh, you know, I, I felt it in my, in my spirit. There was something special, but that, you know, and that did happen occasionally, you know, uh, but uh, I still um, couldn't tell um, where it was going to go. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to talk, um, of course, about the the brand new EP in a moment. Just just before we get there, though, I'm aware we're we're speaking um, quite quite a moment in in history in terms of what we've lived through over the last couple of years now with COVID. And obviously, I've been asking everyone I interview about COVID because how can you not? Mm. Um, it's changed everything for everyone. And I imagine for you, before the pandemic, you were probably quite used to touring um, and yeah, leading yeah. worship, and of course, that would have changed overnight. Um, your your whole career, your whole livelihood would, would have changed. So, you know, as we are hopefully now coming out of the end of this pandemic, what are your reflections, I guess, on how, I guess, on how COVID affected you personally? What, what mm. has the last couple of years been like for you? I think there were, <clears throat> it was a shock, a shock to my wife as well, because I hadn't, I, I hadn't had two years without going away <laughs> after a few days, you know, the traveling. There was a moment when she said, Do you know, would you mind just going away for three days? Like, <laughs> kind of, it was a joke, but uh, I know, I think she was wanting a bit of the space she used to enjoy when I went. <laughs> um, I think there were moments when I wondered, is this it? Am I, you know? Um, and I even, um, I think partly because I wasn't using my voice very much, but um, I started to struggle with with my singing and I thought, am I losing my singing voice, you know? And you start seriously thinking, well, is is this it? Is Am I supposed to ret retire now? Not that I've ever wanted to, but you wonder whether whether that's, that's what's happening. Um, yeah, big adjustments, um, missing the stimulation this you know the demand of standing up in front of a crowd of people and and interacting with them and going somewhere for god you know so there were moments of struggle but at the same time uh i started to read a lot more um which i hadn't done i've always dipped you know in kind of research type reading but i started to read books i wouldn't normally read um and i looking back on it now i think it was a very important time of refreshment um uh, and change and you know i was in a pattern and i could imagine that pattern without the pandemic would have just gone on and on until i finally yeah, <laughs> was was uh, you know too old and too decrepit you know to <laughs> to leave home or whatever um so i, I have felt this you know certainly personally that there's been a, a, a refreshment in it and in it, you know, I, I did do some more songwriting. I mean, I learned how to video myself. Right, yeah. Um, which I think became the most stressful thing I, I can imagine. <laughs> Doing the visuals and the sound of trying to get a good result. Yeah. Had, to, had to be done. Um, but um, some of these songs um, obviously were, were, were being written during that time. Um, and it was refreshing. In fact, it was... Um, uh, before the pandemic, um, I was with um, Jake Isaac, who's a very, very talented singer songwriter. And in fact, he he grew up in uh, the London church I was a part of um, as a youngster. So even at 14 years old, he 
might be drumming for, you know, as I led worship, is sort of age of my kids and whatever. Anyway, we got together and talked songwriting stuff. And I happened, I happened to play him um, Simon's song, that Footsteps on the Sea. And he really loved the song. And, and he said, I didn't know you ever wrote songs like that. You know, he'd never heard about that whole era. Um, and um, he got very thoughtful <clears throat> about it. So, you know, asked me, do I still write songs like that? I said, well, not really, because there's not much call for it. Um, and so he sort of threw down a challenge. He obviously got something in his in his heart, you know. Um, um, he said, look, if you write some more songs like that, I, I'd love to, if you let me, produce an EP um, of them. And um, I thought, well, that's that's pretty good because he's, he's, you know, he's he's a very, very talented musician and writer and producer and so on. Um, so I said, yes, um, and well. it gave me the motivation I needed <clears throat> to um, to write some more story songs, um, which um, uh, and we recorded them um, and finished the recording, I think last October, and then thought, what do we do with this? <laughs> <laughs> until, until somebody in my circle said, "Oh, Graham, did you realise that next year, you know, 2022 is uh, 50 years since your first album?" And, and you hadn't realised. <laughs> and I thought, Bang, "Okay, okay, okay." There's something going because I knew God yeah. was in this somehow with Jake, and but I didn't know what. But then I think it started to unfold that there was something to celebrate. Um, so that I can tell the story. Um, and uh, I guess I think people need to know where you come from, particularly when you get older, because people think you just appear from nowhere and do what you do. And they don't realize, you know, there's, uh, it's important to know that, you know, there's a whole preparation time for all of us, you know, different stages, different phases, different seasons. Um, and people that open the way for you people that make possible what you what you do without whom you probably wouldn't be doing what you do so to be able to tell that story um has, has be has been a real privilege amazing and that ep is is out now it's called where it all began and as you say it's it's a glimpse into some of your earlier music so you've you've re-recorded haven't you um the, that early song and there's also some new material is that right that's right, Simon's song, and um, I wrote a, a song with Lucy Grimble um, called Four Days, which is about uh, Lazarus, um, one about Mary and Martha, um, and one of one set in the Garden of Gethsemane. So, in so, that, all... so that YouTube commenter I mentioned earlier in the program is going to get exactly what they wanted when they said, Graham, can I have some more storytelling songs? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, um, to uh, that coming out. And... That's great. Well, um, just before we go, I just had a, a couple of other questions really linked to the pandemic, I suppose, because the, the pandemic was a tumultuous time for, for everyone, as I mentioned. But um, it was sad to see, I think, there, there were a number of cases of, of church leaders, um, to quote unquote, falling from grace, some some scandals even in the church, which was painful for a lot of people. I, I know when I interviewed um, uh, your, your friend and colleague, Martin Smith, um, a couple of months ago, he he spoke about how some of these pastors were his friends and he had to watch as, as, as there were some really bad stories in the church. And it, it struck me that, that for yourself, um, as I say, reflecting back on so many years of music and, and Christian ministry, that, that you, you must, this is not new to you. And, and sadly, throughout church history and recent years, there are stories of actually people who, who we look up to in ministry and in church life um, mm -hmm. doing things that aren't right and being found out and being caught out. And I wondered if you had any reflections, especially for those who might be listening, who really struggle with this. And perhaps for them, it's a new thing, actually, to see, wow, there's this pastor I loved or this, this Christian person mm. in ministry mm. who I really respected, either, either locally or internationally. And because mm. I know for some Christians, when that happens, it can really rock their faith. And I wondered mm. if you had any helpful thoughts on that, because as I say, this... I'm sure this wouldn't have been the first time you would have heard some of these stories because as I say, sadly, and I know this as a Christian journalist, sadly, these mm -hmm. things do happen mm -hmm. from time mm -hmm. to time. And it can be difficult, can't it, to wrestle with that and to find a way yeah. through. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I can remember, um, you know, in my younger days, um, seeing people that I admire as Christian leaders and, and thinking they were perfect, you know. Um, but it's, it's, 
nobody is you know and some of them some some people's gifting actually means they have bigger flaws because they have a bigger gifting and maybe the bigger potentials for uh, flaws that doesn't justify behavior but it, it's it's a reality that i think we have to um be full of grace you know i think we have to we have to recognize the grace that we all uh, enjoy and we have to we have to be gracious um and get i know it sounds like a cliche but you know, I'm following Jesus, you know, I'm not following uh, that leader and that leader will bring Jesus to me, but their job is to help me follow Jesus. So um, he, Jesus is the, the senior shepherd, you know, he's the chief shepherd. So we have to, we have to make sure we're following Jesus and not just following a personality. Um, I think the other thing, I th it is a lesson for all of us in um community uh real community where we're in genuine relationships um i i always believed in being part of church even when there wasn't a church nearby that i really related to well and i might have struggled with but it was always my ambition i've got to find i've got to get my roots into into church into you know community of faith into um and as far as i can be accountable um <clears throat> and i i think the the isolation is the biggest killer you know um and i th i think real relationships i've been very blessed with uh, you know when i was in my early 30s <clears throat> an older christian gathered a, a group of us together and we started meeting three times a year just it's just just pray for each other and tell our stories and be honest and whatever and we still meet all these years later and it's it's a safe place of disclosure you know or i'll say excuse me i'm really struggling or you know so i th i think it's important to have those kind of relationships um but i but perhaps even well alongside that i would say i think we've neglected the inner life i th i think we've put so much emphasis on the events and, and the the big things that uh, we all gather together have a great time or you know somebody some great preacher or worship band gets up and and brings us to a very special place but what about our own how do we sustain our own personal worship lives um and i had i realized <clears throat> when i first started working on intensely on a team that when i went home uh when i had a day off my spiritual life kind of collapsed because it was all built around the excitement and the ministry and there was a you know anointing what god did and you're excited but <clears throat> i i hadn't i hadn't developed a if you like a secret life with god you know i had nowhere to go when it was just me you know um um and i think when jesus put an, an emphasis on the secret place you know he said you know when you give when you fast when you pray shut yourself away uh, and your heavenly father who sees you in secret will reward you openly you know it's, it's, there's got to be a secret place and it, it strikes me that if we don't become secret if we don't have a secret communion with god if we don't become secret worshipers we could very easily become secret sinners and if our lives are so intense and so busy uh, and we've become so important that we don't have time you know, um, and I'm glad to say that I think there are um, a lot of people bringing that emphasis on mm. um, on the on the disciplines on on the disciplines of prayer and worship <clears throat> and the Psalms. And I think in the last twenty years, the the bigger than ever in my life has been the Psalms and praying the Psalms. Um, so I know, even though I don't want to do it, our sinful flesh does not want to pray you know we we don't want to get aside and do this but we have to and i think the psalms help us to do that um so i think yeah um accountability real relationships community local community being known for who you really are um and then developing that inner life is is going to help us yeah. to avoid these things
that's a really uh, profound place to leave it. I love what you say about uh, Psalms. If we had time, I would ask you about Psalm surfing, um, which uh, <laughs> is something you've come up with. Uh, maybe people will have to Google Graham Kendrick Psalm surfing, and I'm sure there's some resources online. I'm so, so sorry out of time, but the new EP is out now. So do check that out wherever music is normally streamed from your whatever device you use. Um, it's uh, where it all began, the EP from Graham Kendrick. Graham, thank you so much for coming on the profile. I've really really enjoyed it thank you sam for having me bless you well thanks so much for listening to the profile podcast today it's been wonderful to have your company before you go can you do me a massive favor and just take 20 seconds to give us a rating and a review wherever you found this podcast it helps other people to discover the show it would mean so much to me so please just do that now give us a rating and a review wherever you found this i would recommend a five out of five but i trust you to be honest obviously so please give us whatever you think we deserve we're bringing you new interviews each and every week right here on the profile podcast a rating and a review helps other people to enjoy and discover the show for themselves have a great rest of your day whatever you're up to and we'll see you next time right here on the profile you've been listening to the profile in association with premier christianity magazine 